All right, thanks very much. A really great, uh, great pleasure to be here. The future. I think it's about first discovering the future before you can own the future. Discovery is an important process. You know, the, the thing that I find most with my clients, which are companies from all over the world and all kinds of sectors, is that they are so busy doing what they do now, so they have no time to discover what's next. And imagine using technology, we can travel so much faster. You know, we're, we're basically going 300 miles an hour on a freeway, not German freeway, of course, right? Uh, but we're looking in the rear view mirror the whole time. Right? I mean, we're going faster all the time. You know, we, we're, we're getting ready to really take off and go into warp drive. But we're looking backwards and saying, oh, yeah, this is 10 years ago. This is what worked, right? Well, you know what's going to happen there is we, we have terrible accidents, right? Nokia, Blackberry. Anybody remember Blackberry? You know those? Yeah? OK. So accidents, right? So not to say that those guys did the wrong thing. It's just you know the speed of things is just mind-boggling. Right? So my mission today is to do something like this for you. Um, it's basically trying to bring a very complex scenario down to a bunch of bottom lines. So therefore, I, by necessity, I'm going to simplify a little bit. Right? So forgive me for doing this. But I, I will also do the good old German thing of giving you some pain. Um, because, you know, without pain, there really isn't any change. And really what we have to think about when we think about the future is a combination of pain and love. Right? For example, when you're approaching a situation like, like uh, publishers, you know, newspaper publishers, this is a very painful time. Right? It's not going to be as good as it was. Right? There is a future, but which one? If you're a car company, you're looking at the, at the fact that which is basically inevitable, we're going to switch to electric cars. So I have driving cars, shared cars. Yeah, it's difficult here in Australia, given the distances, right? But, you know, most cities will have self-driving shared cars where you push a button and you hop in. Do you like this idea of you're the CEO of Porsche? Not really, right? It's painful. But you also fall in love with a new idea. For example, car companies are becoming transportation providers. So the city of Singapore can buy 100,000 self-driving cars. That's not a bad business, right? It's just different. So we need pain and love to actually change. And I'll give you some of both today uh, in, a, in a good mix, I hope. I'm getting excited. I'm taking my jacket off. Um, I'll stop here, though. So most important is that the, uh, you know, we're in a, we're in a casino, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I used to, when I was a musician, I used to play in casinos, and I'll spare you that part. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to an exponential world, right? And this is really mind-boggling when you see what's happening in terms of being exponential. Moore's law, which you know, Metcalfe's law, a bunch of other laws in this regard. Our society is exploding with innovation. We're going to solve major problems. Computer intelligence, sentient machine, machines, right? machines that can think, nanobots in our bloodstream. This is all like science fiction stuff, right? Blade Runner and so on. It's becoming true. I'll show you some examples. So you wouldn't believe all the stuff that we have actually solved in the last couple of years. So we're going to see things like, you know, that, that are essentially at this takeoff point. I think Australia is right at this pivot point. So when you count exponentially, you're counting one, two, four, eight, and so on. But the first couple steps are kind of the same. You know, one, two, three, it's almost the same in one, two, four. But when you get to four, the next step is eight, not five. And that's, what, that's where we are right now. So you think the world is a crazy place? Right? Software is eating the world. Give it 18 months, right? Twice as fast, twice as powerful, 100 times as cheap. I have more computing power in my iPhone than the President of the United States 15 years ago. I mean, it's mind-boggling what we're seeing here. And so basically what we're seeing, uh, an example like WhatsApp, which all of you, I'm sure, are using, right? 600 million users. Right? And what happens with WhatsApp? Now they're becoming, you know, uh, now that they're part of Facebook, they actually changed the telecom economy. $300 million a day is made for it with SMS at the telcos. What's going to happen to that money? Well, do you need SMS when you have WhatsApp? And the answer is probably not. <laughs> so that's real disruptive to everyone. Great book that's coming out from the Singularity University and Peter Diamandis is a book called Exponential Organizations. That's the first thought I want, to, I want you to take home. Right? How do you become an exponential organization? Like following that stick, right? Because humans are not exponential. You're not going to think faster because you tweet. Right? You're not going to be any quicker with your brain memorizing the entire universe of information. That's not possible. IBM Watson can do that, right? 
We can't do that. We are linear for the time being, right? hopefully for quite some time. But our organizations have to be exponential. They have to be faster, more agile, right? more adaptable, more innovative. So William Gibson said, very important science fiction writer, of course, you know, pattern recognition. The future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And if you're in the software business, the tech business, you have to distribute more of the future to yourself. You have to understand what's happening before your client does. And you have to be one step ahead. Here's an example, which some of you may know. Skype is now breaking the barrier of languages. So you have automated language translations in Skype. That future is here. With a Skype translator, it all starts just as with any other Skype call. You just call someone. But now the difference is you have to speak the language. But I want to talk to you by email and you yes. Need any though. Could you change the to a light date? Well, you get the message. You science fiction Skype is now. Very soon, you to have a trans just about market materials, videos, newspapers, right? Google Translate exactly the whole system, right? But they are proofed it. Unbelievable. Or in Japan, where you can see in German, real Japanese, and you can have a conversation with you know, state. The Japanese. There's an app called uh, Say Hi that you may know. That is a primitive version of this. Right? So language problem solved. Will your kids actually learn languages? That's an interesting question. When they can do this. If you can implant that in your head, maybe you don't have to learn languages. So the bottom line is everything is becoming connected. That's for good or for bad. You know, sometimes we worry about this, you know, surveillance. Yes, we scan, right? We can do all of that stuff. Right? We can save everything. We can monitor everybody. That's kind of a drawback of this world of being connected, right? But at the same time, being connected has vast potential of solving global problems. Food, information, education, online education, environmental control. Right? A combination of things, you know, connecting environmental controls with renewable energy can solve global warming. That's possible, together with an attitude, of course, of conservation. But if we're looking at this future, and we're looking at stuff like connected traffic lights, very simple, saves 15% of gas. Los Angeles, ever since I rolled this out, all the drivers are saving 10 to 12% of gas, in average, because of connected traffic lights. The connected home, you can, you can run your air condition while you're in the car. Right? You don't have to keep it on cold the entire day. Just on the way home, you switch it on through your app. Could somebody hack this? Yes, of course. And, and lots of people will try to do that, right? So we need security there. That's mandatory. Yeah? But this connectivity is mind-boggling. So very simple, looking at a world like this, you know, software, apps, big data, artificial intelligence, it's all interconnected. We can't keep them separate. You know about big data, that this is the sort of biggest keyword you know, this year and last year is big data. The year before that, you know, you guess what it was? Social media, whatever that is, right? Now big data is a big deal. But you know, most people, uh, they only use about 0.5% of all the data, of all the big, huge, giant data they have, right? Because they don't know what to do with it. There's no intelligence. And you can do stuff like you can look at your data and you say, you know, I have proof that the more people that use Internet Explorer, the less crime we have. This is the kind of things that, that people come up with. That's big data, right? That's big stupidity. Right? But you combine all these things, you have this kind of interdependence, right? In other words, it's not enough to be good at programming, engineering, or software. Right? There's a social part here. There's a human part. There's understanding interfaces, design. Right? All these things are coming together. So what that means for you guys is the end of silos. You know, the tech guys over here, marketing guys over here, financial people over there, the sales people, you know, some here, over there. Right? It's all the same thing now. The best products 
are those that have intelligence built into the product. That's why the Nike running shoe is so great. Right? Connects to your iPad, connects to the internet, you can compare running data. If you're into that sort of thing, it's cool. Right? So now we have things like through smart devices, we can connect to a whole different world. One example would be iBeacon, which is an amazing technology where you go into a store, you can discover things that you've always wanted to look at, but it's interactively connected. Recently to announced iOS 7 with iBeacons. Put anywhere in the physical world, they broadcast context and location to all compatible phones and smart devices in range. Phones can now automatically pick up the signal and trigger contextual actions designed by business owners. Customers can enjoy a seamless experience with more information. Yeah, you may think this is sort of a marketing gimmick, right? Well, in the way it is, of course, right? Because we want to sell stuff, right? But what it does, it connects your most intimate device, your mobile phone, with things on location. There's huge potential for retailers and for connecting the online and the offline worlds, whatever they will be in the future. One of the results of this is that we were not going to live in a world where we are protected under a dome. Right? I mean, I worked in the music business for a long time. I used to be a musician producer. Then I had the misfortune to work in the music business and try to uh, help them to understand the internet, which is a lost mission, of course, as you know. Uh, so they, they sort of perceive their world to be an isolated place, right? Only four companies in the world control the music business. Whatever they say is what goes, and nobody cares what the consumer actually wants, right? You get the, uh, the right lobbies to figure out your, your, your rights and your legal situation. But the future really is about this, right? It's about being interconnected. You cannot be successful without building an ecosystem. You cannot own the world, right? You can be a big fish in a big pond, but you can't be the only fish. Right? This is interconnected, an ecosystem, right? A shift towards this. Best example is one of my favorite companies in the world, the Tesla car company. You know what they do is they're building an ecosystem of electric cars. They've published all of their patents. Any company, any competitor can use all of the patents that Tesla has cooked up for the last 10 years for free. Tell that to the pharma companies, right? the big medical companies. So interdependent ecosystem, that's really what we're looking at. And this is painful, right? Because you can't own every piece of this giant wheel. You have to actually collaborate. So in this world, you know, you've seen all these things in the past. I mean, this is more than any sane brain can take. Even a 15-year-old would say, this is madness. Right? All the things, I mean, all these, all these memes and tags and keywords, right? you feel like you're in a science fiction novel. Right? Maker, economy, autonomous vehicles, uh, and so on. Every day there's something new. So in this exponential future, we got to think about what we're doing. And what's happening here in Australia is that we already have 140,000 people employed in the app economy, right? which is a software economy, really. But the future for this holds, you know, this could very easily be a million people when we talk about the Internet of Things. Of course, we also have the opposite effect of machines and robots taking people's jobs, like a cab driver or an accountant, a bookkeeper. Don't tell your kids to become bookkeepers. Bad idea. So here we have an economy to where, uh, there's, you know, sort of in a, in a joke, you could say, keep calm, there's an app for that. Right? But of course, the reality is there's not. There's not an app for everything. Some things will require a bit more uh, human engineering than an app. But maybe your iPad or your mobile phone looks like this. Right? That's what mine looks like, kind of. So I want to show you my favorite apps because I figured you would appreciate. The first one is an app where you can part the Red Sea. Uh, this is an, an app for Moses. Yeah. It's a little bit late for him, but this is a very powerful app. The other one I like a lot is the Aussie insult generator. I think it was popular here last year where you can generate an insult on the fly and just you know, use that for a party. And this one is kind of late for myself. I got divorced eight years ago, but it's a divorce app. Right? All these things are happening. I mean, it's mind boggling. There's an app that twitters that your baby has a wet diaper right? called Tweet P. Right? <laughs> and this, is, this is serious. I'm not joking. This is actually happening. Right? But this kind of shows you, you know, going back to Moses here, Whatever can be digitized will be. 
You may not appreciate this if you're in the music business or the publishing business or the banking business. Think about digital money. 54% of transactions in Africa are done through mobile devices, not through banks. And who owns those companies? The telco providers, the startups, the internet companies. Some of you may be in the banking business. Of course, you know, you're lucky here because you don't really have that competition here, right? But as Bill Gates says, you know, people need ba uh, banking, but do they need banks? Interesting question. Media, right? You can see here advertising, newspapers, radio. I mean, if you're in the radio business or the newspaper business, you know, that's not a good idea right now to think about what, what kind of advertising you're going to get in the future. The total media ad spend is moving towards mobile and digital. Australia is actually a leader in mobile advertising, as is, of course, Indonesia. Then we have automation. The Google self-driving car, latest edition here, right? brings us to the second rule, anything that can be automated will be. Kind of a depressing thought when you think about human possibilities, right? I mean, it's not been much fun to drive in this car. Right? It just takes you a place. You know, you don't get to kick ass and do stuff there. Right? It just drives. You, know, you can check your email or eat hamburgers or something. But, you know, everything that can be automated will be automated. Everything that can be digital will become digital. That's kind of a digital Darwinism in a way, you know. That's where we're going. So that leads me to an interesting conclusion. In the military, which I don't quote very often, they use a term called VUCA. You should remember this because that's your future. Right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. That is where we're going because the world is getting connected, which means a lot more conversation. It's interesting to see that we have solved global poverty to some degree. People are getting richer, so to speak, in developing countries. We've kind of solved large wars, not small wars. But everything else is getting utterly complicated. So the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company has decreased to 15 years. So what are we going to do about this? This is where we're going because of technology, because of all the disruptive changes. I think the answer is we have to flip the VUCA. I call it to flip the VUCA using the same abbreviation. Velocity, speed. Unorthodoxy. Richard Branson comes to mind with that, of course. Number one, collaboration. And a good American term, awesomeness. If you can do that, you can beat VUCA. And that's really kind of what software and apps are all about, right? Velocity, speed, collaboration. We're living in a world to where exponential growth is not just technology, but it's also knowledge. I mean, the stuff you can know now. I mean, if you want to figure out how to do HTML5 programming, right? You can just go to Coursera, the Khan Academy, or YouTube, right? And if you're smart, you can learn that in a couple hours. Now, I would never learn that, but some people do. Right? Exponential growth of knowledge. The brain outside of our brain. We can basically solve every answer at any time. The, you know, we can just go in and say, OK, what is the best sushi place here? What is the rating of this guy? What does he look like on LinkedIn? That's external knowledge. One simple swipe gives you the information that is relevant to you right now. As you leave your house, Google Now is smart enough to check current traffic conditions and has prepared an alternate route for your commute. Google Now is always one step ahead, so you can feel more confident as you navigate your day. That does that? Just got a jellyfish warning. Want to try counting? Let's go to Zuma. Morning, kids. These are two examples from Google. One is Google Now, which all of you have on the Google app in your smartphone. And Google now takes all of the information about you, your search, right? Google knows you better than your husband or your wife because of your search, right? That's a real benefit. Right? By the way, by disclosure, Google is one of my clients. I'm, if I talk bad about them, is I mean it, you know, in positive spirit. But, but uh, so what Google now does is, is bring all the information together and gives me cards about what's happening in my day. My flight is late, you know, my, my information about where I could eat and so on and so on. And the Google 360 Moto watch does it on my wristwatch, on my wrist, right? So I can look at my stock market portfolio. I can do all those important things that, I, that need constant attention. So in a way, my brain is outsourced 
to my mobile device. Okay? And that's becoming kind of a standard, you know, it's a scary thought. This is kind of where we're going. That's good or bad. Discuss in the panel what that means. Basically, what I feel with transportation is that connectivity data have software. Right? Google can drive on cars. It does its car, right? It drives data. It's 800 megabytes per second of data. Otherwise, it doesn't. So it moves on data. Internet of Things, right? a company called Network Science, has journals. They're writing journals for magazine and a machine. And read them, simple article about, you know, a stock market performance. The robot can do that. Talk about the election or something. It's simple stuff. Do. So artificial intelligence is everywhere now. And this is areas coming out of this. Basically, transformation for all of us means to go beyond change. So when you go home tonight, if you go home tonight, think about how you can transform into the next business, not just make a minor change. I mean, you have to make minor changes to improve what you do, right? But it's really about the question, who are you going to be in three to five years? I mean, that is a crucial question because you have to prepare what that means and which way you're going. Because I worked in the music business for a long time, I'll show you some slides from this because it's a great example of how not to do things, right? You want to improve your business, just do the opposite than the music guys. The global recorded music revenues, and you see here going up to so details and so on, it was clear in 1999 that music is moving to the cloud. You hit a button, the music plays. YouTube, Spotify, Zimfire, you have hundreds of services of that now. But their assumption was if people can do that right, and make random copies and free copies, our business is dead. Turns out it's exactly the opposite. This is going to happen anyway. So after this serious decline, 71% decline of revenues. I mean, you know, you would get fired for having 10% of that loss. 71% of revenue decline. They're finally figuring out that this is what people want. I call this a toxic assumption, a poison. It sits in the back of your mind and says, if, we, if you do this, it's dangerous. Because you've never actually looked at it. So those toxic assumptions are really important, you know, because in the end, you know, you can't fax a cat. You can try it, right? But what is the future is the future. I mean, five years from now, ask your kids. They know what the future is. Right? The future of banking, unfortunately, is not going to a place to pick up money. Right? Yeah, you may go there to pick up a loan. Right? I mean, those things are clear, right? You can't fax a cat. So the key question really is that you have to ask yourself, whether you're in the travel business or banking or oil or mining or whatever, is your business digitally contested? Somebody can invent of software to do something, Airbnb, hotel, like for car, Dropbox, something really cool. If you're in the movie business, you have to only would buy a DVD now. Oh, sorry, yeah. some people still do. Like, you know, I buy some DVDs, right? So, I mean, if you're looking at this fact, this used to be about 70% of the revenues of the movie companies were DVDs. And now what do we do now? BBC iPlayer, Hulu, tunneling, IP tunneling, Netflix, you know, whatever you do to do that, mostly legal or illegal, doesn't really matter. Right? In the end, you're paying a fraction of that now. And that's reality. You can't go back and say, you know what, I don't really like this idea. We want you to spend $25 for each DVD and then have them region coded. You can't watch them in Hong Kong, right? right? Whatever the deal is. If you are digitally contestable, you have to face it. Uber is a great example. I don't know if you know Uber. It's, a, it's an on-demand taxi ride service that's peer-to-peer -peer with independent contractors that you use to the app. You just hit the button and people turn up. So there's been lots of uh, you know, global unrest about Uber. In fact, it was just outlawed in Berlin last week for insurance, you know, I would say, lobby reasons. But 
the bottom line is this, right? If you're managing dissatisfaction, like a, most taxi drivers are, right? We're essentially not that satisfied with them, but what else are we going to do, right? Go to New York to figure this out. Managed dissatisfaction is not a sustainable business model. So a good exercise for your company is to go home and say, okay, let me look at all those things in my company that are sort of dissatisfying, that we're sort of navigating around, and then eradicate each one of them. That's what Amazon is doing, for example. That's why they are so powerful. Managed dissatisfaction, not a good business model. Great example is the New York Times. The, world, the world's most reputable newspaper, the best writers, really. They decided to put a paywall. I'm sure you've experienced the paywall of the New York Times. Right? If you happen to like the New York Times and you have the audacity of going more than 10 times, right, they will tell you to bugger off right? or pay $350 to read it. The result of that is, as you can see here, total decline of homepage traffic, impending irrelevance for the biggest newspaper in the world. Right? Yeah, a million people are subscribing. Okay, big deal. They're not all paying $300, though. So. But everything else, if you look at the stats, look at these stats here, right? Advertising revenues, gone. Is that a solution to the problem, is to put up a wall? And their assumption was really quite simple. Their assumption was to say, controlling access enforces payment. Right? It's, it's logical. Well, never mind it's logical. People don't understand the customer. You have to think about pay will, not pay wall. Right? How do I certainly get you money by delighting you with what I do? That's what everybody else does. Right? You have to solve that problem by thinking about what people will actually do. That brings me to a very important slide, and I, I promise you some pain. This is the pain. Right? I should put on my German outfit now. But technology and business, you know, we're basically going through a development where technology is changing most of our world. Music, film, publishing, print, advertising, media, banking, mining, insurances, energy. Right? And that succession happens to all of us. If you want to look at the future, look at the music guys, and then say what's going to happen to me. So here, in that change, we're looking at a low point of this to where we have what I call the valley of death. Is technology has changed all of this, but on the other side, is a great business that just haven't gotten there yet. So if you're running a newspaper, you know that there's going to be 5 billion people on the internet with mobile devices. There should be a great audience. Right? But right now, there's the old subscribers who are saying, you know what? We can read for free online. So the valley of death is an important phase. Most of the responses of people that I work with is denial. And saying, oh, you know, it's, that's true, it's going to happen to those guys, but not to me. Because we're immune. We're so good that nobody can do what we do. That's especially true for business to business, right? Because you have relationships. And that matters, right? It matters a lot. But the bottom line is we're going to have to think about building a bridge. There's only three things you can do here with the valley of death. One is you, you slim down, you bring lots of water, and you go through it. And if you're lucky, you come out the other end. The second one is you deny it and you don't go, which is a certain death, really. And the third one is you transform, you build a bridge. So if you're digitally contestable, you have to figure out how to build a bridge. That, that's our mission of using software, using apps. I mean, apps are an interesting exercise in this because sometimes we can bridge something and find out what people actually want. And we get feedback from people, and actually, we can mind the gap and move forward into that new world. Right? For example, with money, this company called TransferWise. If you want to send money to the US, to your son or whatever, this will cost you a dollar. If I send money from Switzerland with Credit Suisse, $30 fee. Right? Three days it takes. Why? This is managed dissatisfaction, plain and simple. They do it because they can. Not a good idea, right? That is not a good future-proof business. If you're in the book business, you know where this is going. Right? Yes, people will be printing because they want to collect stuff. Right? But the future isn't in printing. 
Digital textbooks will allow all students to go online, have, an, have a pad, you know, a, a mobile device for $5, and read and learn anything attached to the cloud. So digitization, automation, fragmentation. And that's kind of hyper-efficient. I say hyper-efficient because it's like ultra-efficient, right? Probably a little bit too efficient sometimes in the sense that it's not really human sometimes to be that efficient as technology can do. And that creates other challenges. So Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, has a great motto. And he lives by this. Right? It's amazing what he does. Proactively delighting customers earns trust. So his number one motto is delighting customers. Nothing else matters. You go back to the boardroom and say, is this going to be a delight to our customers? Otherwise, screw it, right? because you don't need it. Amazon has a, on their new box has a button. Right? Uh, I think one is, this one is called the uh, uh, yeah, May Day. It's called the May Day button. You hit the button if you have a problem on the Kindle, and you get a live video connection, a live person, not a robot. Right? Amazon launched a music service. Guess what? It's free for all of the prime customers. They launched a video service. Guess what? They don't charge me. It's free. And how can they do that? Well, they have the licenses anyway, right? They don't have to pay extra for me for, to be free from me. And this is the result of Amazon's strategy, right? Killing every single category. Customer delight. And how can you have customer delight through software and through apps? Right? Well, apps are kind of the vehicle for customer delight. Right? Because that's what we all are now using to interact and to get back with people. And software is eating the world, was said earlier, moving from television in a box that we surf through. And our kids are now thinking of television as the cloud. I mean, ask your kids, you know, anybody under 20, television isn't a hardware piece, right? It's a, it's a click. And books are digital. Right? And this is me with my old car. Uh, cars are becoming digital, right? sharing, renting, all these things. I mean, this is, this is not a bad thing. It's just a huge change if you're a car company, right? So, I mean, there's lots of business in this, but, you know, the future of the car clearly is going to be one of those things. Right? Yeah, we'll have people driving fancy cars by themselves, but it'll get harder and harder and harder right? to actually do that. Maybe we can do that in the, somewhere out in the bush. So what happens here is that digital devices and services and platforms are moving in on us. We're going from carrying stuff to wearing it on our wristwatch or Google Glass. Right? Having the internet on the iris right, with the contact lens, which already is possible, using Google Glass, of course, and ultimately like this guy, Neil Arbison, who has a blue chip sensor in his skull transferring visual images to sounds in his head. I mean, this is actually reality, right? People are doing this, right? And you see this little gongle he's wearing. So probably wouldn't want to do that, you know, just, just to try it out. But. So as the world is turning, it's basically becoming intelligent everything. And in many ways, you could say technology is becoming intelligent, but we are not. Right? I mean, we are in some degree, but not like this. And when I show you this clip now, you, you won't think this is actually real. You think this is a spoof, but I assure you it's not. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. That makes you wonder, do you actually need a family? I, you, you can just delete everyone and, and play with Jibo, right? Maybe there's a Jibo for all kinds of things, you know, who knows, right? But intelligent everything. I mean, this is the future that we're seeing basically based on this thing, right? Based on big data. Because Jibo couldn't do anything if it didn't know me. So all the things that we're doing, what we're sharing, where we come from, where we've been, what we've looked for, who we are connected with, is creating a giant data stream. 
And this was true 10 years ago, but the order of magnitude is now like this, right? I mean, you can't even see the data from 10 years ago compared to what we have now. And this is creating all kinds of opportunities and societal problems, of course, which we also have to solve. You know, it's a different discussion. But what we see here is basically a scenario to where, for example, business intelligence was a Fiat 500 with a light shot out until about two years ago, right? Today, we have business intelligence is warp drive, right? You can figure out anything, real-time sentiment analysis, tracking your customer. In theory, you can know all of these things. This is what Google wants to do, of course, right? Be the Star Trek, the enterprise of, of big data. So what happens here is that we can find out all these things, right? This is going warp drive and, and making us look at things like LinkedIn. Right? 380 million people on LinkedIn. Every meeting you go to, right, what do you do first? Check them out on LinkedIn, right? to see what they look like and you know, what school they went to. It takes only 20 seconds, but if you're not on LinkedIn, either stupid or rich, you know, one of the two. Right? That's what people figure. You know, I'm not sure that's true, but you can see this here, what's happening with the market value of this. right? So the best apps that are out there, they're really about relationships. Right? And you know what? The future of business is not about saying, well, you can buy this and selling in the sense of saying, click here to buy. Right? The future of business is about maintaining relationships, building trust, creating brand loyalty, right? building the customer service into the product, like Ducati has in this short video here. They use an app for people to configure the Ducati. End result is most people that buy a motorcycle now from them spend twice as much money as before they had the app, right? because it's so much fun to configure. And you've seen this before for car companies, of course, right? It's not rocket science. So the average used to be about 18,000 euros to buy a Ducati, now it's 34,000 euros using the app. Right? If you're using Uber, the car service, you give it a try sometimes when you get to a place. I think it's, it's actually here in Sydney, isn't it? Yeah, so when you use this, this app actually does everything. It does the customer service, it does the payment, it does the social, it does the tracking. It does all of this. The product is the service. The customer relationship is the product. And that's a benefit that we're seeing here. CRM is built into the product. So the future of technology is coming to us at a mind-boggling pace. Five years from now, we'll be sitting here and saying, oh, God, you know, back then, that was, that was traditional. Right? That was a lame world. And today, we're like, God, we're on fire. Good or bad, many things about this, but really what it comes down to is this. If you want to be in business in five years, you need technology and you need trust, right? That is not the same thing. You build trust by providing service, right? by being in invaluable, by being indispensable. And you get to be indispensable because you use technology. So those two things go together. Don't think of yourself as a machine or your customer as a machine or is everything as an algorithm? Right? Business is not an algorithm. Part of it is an algorithm we use to do business. Right? So this is very important to keep in mind also not to abuse your relationship with the, with the customer by using their data without authorization, for example. By killing the golden goose, as we see now many discussions about what's happening on the web with net neutrality and internet governance and many things like this. And then there is this topic, right? Your future, if you're not already 73, well, you, you still have a future of 73 as well, right? But it's a different topic. Right? Many of our jobs will fall prey to automation. 65% in Europe, I read the other day, 68% of jobs in the next 20 years in Australia. Check out clerks, bookkeepers, here's a list. Right? Bookkeepers number one, because now you have these New Zealand guys from zero. XERO, do you know that company? Right? Their goal is to kill, in parentheses, 20 million bookkeepers and accountants using the software package. And I'm using it. It's mind-boggling. 200 bucks saves me $5,000 for my bookkeeper. I can have my son do my bookkeeping now with scanning stuff and putting it in there. Right? That's what happens with automation. So here's a list of jobs that will go away. Right? Loan officers, receptionists, paralegals, 
retail people, taxi drivers, security guards, cooks for fast food, and so on and so on. This may sound depressing to you, looking at how many regular jobs will go away here. But what it does, it frees us up to do all kinds of new jobs that haven't even been invented yet. And it makes us into entrepreneurs. I should say that because in Switzerland, for example, where I live, you know, most people don't start their own company. I think in the US it's about 20%, in Australia it's about eight, and in Switzerland it's 1.2%. Right? So the future of that is you know, us creating things, you know, as my uh, colleague says, Thomas Fry, 60% of the best jobs in the next 10 years haven't even been invented yet. That, those are the jobs for your kids. So that's the kind of reality that we're heading into. And you know, to summarize, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine says, machines are for answers, humans are for questions. In other words, you could say, software is for solutions and for answers. Humans are for discussions, for creativity, for imagination, for questions. It's not either or, you, you, you do have to have both. Right? They, they work together quite nicely. I always say that algorithms, uh, this is an artificial word called a portmanteau, or whatever that is called actually, a neologism, right? a humor rhythm. Right? Every algorithm needs a humor rhythm. When you launch an app or a piece of software, you have to also launch in your head what this will do to people and figure out the business model behind this. Right? Going back to the right brain, imagination, negotiation, questioning, that is our role in the future. Our role is not to beat machines or to beat software or to be quicker or smarter or better because we can't. Our role is to move to this part of the brain. To summarize, the future of technology in business is really this. is awesome technology, which all of us are excited about, and has huge potential to do all kinds of things and solve large global problems. Great people and credible purpose. Your company has to have a purpose. The purpose is not to optimize revenues. That is a secondary purpose. So that is really important for the future, those, those three things. I'll give you a quick summary, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a discussion on the panel later. Point one, everything is getting connected. As much as we wish it wasn't, it's almost impossible to escape that. And there is a trend towards what's called offline is the new luxury, right? checking into a hotel that does not have internet, or that, that thwarts the mobile phone, you know, and puts up in a, a cloak so you can't be reached, right? Those things are happening. That's not bad, but everything is getting connected. That is our future. Interdependence. Right? If you're in the tech business, you're actually also in the marketing business. Right? You're in the, art, uh, in the product development business. You're in the PR business. Right? You have to think of all these things as part of the product. The valley of death. Be honest with yourself. Looking at your business and saying, or at, at yourself as a person, and saying, you know, what I'm doing used to be great, and there's something else great over here, but how do I get over there? Don't deny the valley of death, because what happens is you get sucked in deeper and deeper, like the music business or the news business, the publishing business, by saying, this is not going to happen to me because I'm so great. That's unlikely, except for futurists, of course. So, the other thing is manage dissatisfaction. I mean, look at your business and say, you know, I looked at my business the other day saying, oh man, there's a lot of dissatisfaction. I never noticed because we're managing it very nicely. Up come companies who don't do that. Netflix comes up and says, you know what? Forget the cable guys. 10 bucks a month, you can do anything you want. Now what happens is if a kid moves out of the house, and when they're 20 or so, they never subscribe to cable. They never buy cable. They have the internet. That's it. Right? You know where this is going. I mean, clearly that's disruptive. Right? Trust and technology. The more software you have, the more apps you have, the more trust you have to build. And of course, one builds the other. Right? Because the purpose of business is to generate trust. Finally, delighting customers. I mean, that is the reason why we do everything. So I ask myself sometimes when I do things, I say, would, would I, if I was on the receiving end of this, would I be delighted? Yeah, I am. It's so. Yeah. Delightful, gone. That, that's our choice. So I'll leave you with a quote from Alan Kay, famous computer scientist. 
the best way to predict the future is to create it.